So, well, welcome everyone to Graduate Professional Success in STEM program at UC Irvine. We were previously called GPS Biomed because it was funded by a different um, grant. So my name is Arender Singh and I'm the program director of uh, the program. I was the associate director before and Dr. Fruman who is here, Dr. Fruman was the previous director of NIH sponsored, um, NIH best sponsored GPS Biomed program. Uh, David, would you like to say anything before we get started with our very brief presentation? Sure. Welcome everybody. I'm glad to see so many people here for the registration orientation. Uh, yeah, so I was a, a, a PhD program director in from 2011 to 2015 when I began to appreciate that uh, apart from the tremendous academic and scientific training that we could provide here at UCI that there was something missing which was the professional development and all the soft skills needed to succeed in a variety of career paths, both in, within and outside academia. So I applied as PI for one of these NIH best grants and there were 17 awarded over two years and UCI was one of those 17 sites and the only one in Southern California. And it's been exciting over the past uh, uh, seven years now to build this program, first with Emma Flores Kim and now with Harinder Singh uh, and to see it grow and develop and expand to different disciplines. And it's really been a success. And it, it kind of, I think I felt a culture change here at UCI, both with students, postdocs, and as well as with faculty and administrators that we take a holistic approach to training and we want to support you from when you ar arrive until when you leave in pursuing your dreams and finding you the career that you find fulfilling and rewarding uh, and giving you the skills to do that. So that's our goal. Uh, it's especially important right now in these pandemic times and with uncertainty yeah. with the virus, but also politics and weather um, that uh, to know that uh, the university is thinking about you and your future and that we have programs to help prepare you for, for that. And some of these also involve coping with stress and uncertainty. Uh, and we're, we're big sponsors of those sorts of activities as well. So I won't take any more time. I just want to encourage you all to participate to the extent that you can. Uh, it might change over time as you get more close to the next transition point, but the resources are there and please take advantage of them. So go ahead, Harinder, take it from here. Awesome, thank you very much, Dr. Fruman. So as Dr. Fruman was mentioning, this is the only program in the Southern California region, which is very unique compared to other career and professional development programs like graduate division of postdoc affairs offices exists in all the different institutes. But this is a unique program, um, which as David said, like a couple of, uh, I mean, 17 different sites and UCI was lucky to have that. So when you're in academic training, uh, UCI does an amazing job and academics do an amazing job to pr prepare you for academic training. However, when you look at the data, a large majority of them uh, due to funding reasons or, or the in changing interest reasons transition into non-academic careers. So we really wanna make sure that you are prepared before you start looking into those alternative careers. And additionally, we also wanna emphasize on the academic careers because um, I mean, we've heard from our PIs and other people who are on the hiring committee saying that the quality of faculty candidates has also been kind of going down over the period of time. So these are the programs which really help to fill that void by imparting uh, science communication skills and really helping to you know, build your communication skills as a scientist. So the so main focus of the program for first five years have been, has been to prepare you for a variety of careers which come in, come out of PhD and postdoctoral training. And not a bunch of information and knowledge is out there. Our program tries to provide that information. So this not only helps uh, students and postdocs to become skilled res researchers, but also polish professionals right now so that you do not have to spend a lot of time after you graduate to find what might be the right career for you if you fit in or if you can transition and be successful there. So why career and professional development programming? To be very honest, you know, I, if I were to share my experience and I'm sure David would agree that when we were PhD students and postdocs, we didn't really have this kind of career and professional development programs at our respective institutions. And that this program um, 
really helps you to understand how the academic career, like how academic enterprise has changed over the period of time. So the traditional model of academia in the past has been you do your PhD, you do your undergrad, master's, PhD, do a postdoc, and then mainly people got into academia, research or industry, uh, teaching careers. And then some of them, you know, because industry and research careers are directly related to the academic research, people transition into that because it's relatively has been easier. But then other people slowly, you know, by different ways, either it's biomedical or other STEM related careers, um, non academic careers, they transition into. However, there was no like you know, enough training for that. So the NIH best grant, which David was mentioning earlier, it was a broadening experiences in scientific training, giving you a broader training while you're still an academic trainee. So during your PhD training, you involved in, get involved in multiple different professional development activities right here in PhD. And then if you are transitioning to PhD postdoc, or if you think that, you know, it helps to get a postdoc before you transition to multiple different careers, uh, then you get into postdoc and you even during the postdoc period, you keep preparing for these different careers you have going on. Uh, okay. And so this, this has been the model and the model has changed. And then NIH and National Science Foundation, a lot of granting agencies are actually trying to emphasize this model that you prepared for things right now before you transition. Let's see. So when you're thinking of transitioning into different careers, there you have to keep in mind whether it's academia or beyond academia, there are some skills which are in high demand for any kind of career. So you're in academia, you're in PhD postdoc training. This is a time when you're still building your careers, you know, skill set. So this is where your skills are skill loading and uh, loading as you're working in the lab or teaching TA. And, but keep in mind that there, you know, as a PhD, by the time you get out of your PhD, you already have a lot of these skills, which are called transferable skills. And the list right here are some of the skills which industry or academic sector, higher education looks for. You have to be a great communicator. Public speaking has to be one skill, which you'll be doing a lot, whether you stay in academia, do teaching, or you get into industry. You have to work within teams and leadership roles. You have to understand the business um, concepts, whether it's academia or industry, should be able to multitask, project management, networking. So we'll get to that uh, very soon, but then keep in mind, these are the things which you are already do or you will be doing as you're going through your PhD postdoctoral training. So, uh, you know, so basically what we're trying to do here is we're trying to make you realize that there is really not a big difference between what you will be doing outside. You're already doing that and you just have to sort of repackage your skills and then sell it as if you are that right candidate to get into that field or the next career. So we have a four pillar model of our program. So there has to be, you know, a little bit of a philosophy behind our program, which is, first of all, you have to know what might be the best career for you, depending on um, you know, what your skills, interests, and values are. So you have to do some sort of like, you know, skill scan, strength finder. There are a lot of different programs out there. Uh, if you're a STEM non-biomedical trainee, I would highly recommend to you, I mean, even biomedical trainees, you should read Strengths Finder. This book has been amazing. You can learn a lot about what your quality strengths are and you should focus on that. Maybe weaknesses, you can work a little bit, but it'll tell you like, you know, maybe this is a career path you should not pursue. Skillscan is another um, sort of a software. So far, it's actually UCI, I think has a subscription. You can go online and do the skill scan. But what we've been using for past five years, individual development plan, my individual development plan. Um, this is primarily for a biomedical scientist and then chemistry folks have something called as chem IDP. They can use that, which will give you like, almost like 20, 22 different careers where you might fit in and then you can start preparing for that right now. So our four pillar model basically, first of all, helps you to explore different careers which are out there based on these skill scan and IDP and all these softwares. And then we provide you specific training for a couple of careers you think, okay, that's where I might fit in. So I would like more training for that. And once you, as you're getting the training, we also try to give you that experience, how it is to work in that career before you transition there. So you get a taste of, you know, what that whole field is like. Once you've gone through these three, three steps, you know, we help you with career transition. We provide you avenues to transition easily into these, uh, these careers. And I'll talk in, in detail about all these uh, steps and, you know, how many different activities we do within those uh, pillars. 
So the first one is exploring different careers. So, you know, as I said, we help you to, you know, make you aware about diverse careers. Some of the events, uh, we have a couple of events. One of them, the most popular one is usually we do it at noon. You know, it used to be in person. We would provide lunch and all that. Unfortunately, that's not possible right now. But still, you know, we've seen, you know, a surge in number of people who are attending these afternoon events. So it's called Life Beyond the PhD. And, and whenever I start this event, I always say there is life beyond PhD. This is not the end. In fact, it, it's very bright right after you finish your PhD. So during these events, we try to bring in our alumni and other professionals who've gone through PhD training and working in, who are working in many different job sectors right now. So, you know, they do like 15, 20 minutes of their like, you know, either PowerPoint or their career journey and talk specific about their job. And then there's a Q&A session where they'll, you'll get to ask specific questions. These are examples of some of the events we've done in the past with the business concepts. Julius is our alumni. And then we've also had one event with um, someone who got their PhD in molecular biology, and then now they're working in beer and wine industry. To, you know, a few more examples, Duke was also part of our program. He works in a startup now very far from us um, here in um, University Lab Partners, which is within the UCI Beal Applied Innovation. So this is a very shorter, smaller event. You connect just one hour, you come and then listen to their career journey, ask them specific questions, and then you move on. But then we have more um, detailed event, which is the uh, career uh, networking night. So basically, we do a panel discussion, you know, bring in panelists who are working in those different career sectors and we pick a different topics every time. And then in the end, you get to do networking with them. So in-person networking, again, there was food and beer and everything, but that's not possible. You can bring your own food and beer now, but uh, we do e-networking. There are Zoom breakout rooms, which does allow us to, you know, offer that, uh, that opportunity to still be able to stay connected online. So this is the guy you might be, um, as you're starting and trying to figure out like where should I go and these are the the programs which you're offering will help you to give that exposure to different careers so teaching careers is something these are the two events this event is coming up very soon um, I'll send that add that in the chat you guys can RSVP or if you are in our listserv uh, you'll be getting those emails about the event we've organized events on science writing regulatory affairs industry research careers another one which is coming up now is uh, careers in Nonprofits, a lot of scientists, PhD level, even masters, undergrad, they actually work in nonprofit sector. And you need to know from these people who've gone through all this training, and some of them actually run their own organization. They hire a lot of undergrad, masters, PhD, and postdoc level people. So this is another um, opportunity to not only listen to four people who are working in the same career, four or five, but then you get to network with them and ask specific questions. And then these are the networks which you're building right now will help you a lot in future to when you're ready to transition to those careers. This is an example of how we are doing everything online now in webinar format. And after that, we get into breakout rooms. So then we get it to the train part. You know, you really need that training um, uh, you know, to transition into those careers or learn, you know, what is what one of the biggest skill set, uh, which is needed, we give you training right now. So some of the foundation skills, which you will need, whether you stay in academia or get into any career is communication skills. So we have this um, workshop by Bree McWhorter. She runs effective communication skills for scientists. It's a certificate program. And the second one is elevator pitch workshop. And then there's an elevator pitch competition. So there's a workshop coming up on November 2nd. And after she runs this workshop, there'll be one-on-one -on -one sessions with the students. And then they, the students and postdocs and will participate in the elevator pitch competition during which you can actually talk either about your research, you can talk about any other passion you have, if you've been volunteering outside or any other you know, outside interests you have, you can talk about those interests. And so this is really impactful. You can see that you know people who uh, we've listened, heard a lot of research talks and all that, you can see people who've gone through this training, it gets reflected in their research talks. And another thing about um, the, the elevator pitch, um, is that this is a very short two minute pitch. It's open to PhD students, postdoc, you can pick any topic. And we used to do this thing in uh, at UCI Beal Applied Innovation larger venue, but now this is happening online. We did our last one online. And um, I would highly recommend that because 
imagine when, you know, I mean, I, I'm trying to think of when I was a PhD student, and I'm sure a lot of us can relate to that here, when you have to present in journal clubs or research talks and everything, there is this, you know, sense of intimidation, you know, we are like scared, we, you know, like looking in front of like 200 people at an international conference. This Breeze workshop will really give you that confidence to face the audience and have that body language so that you're able to uh, confidently engage your audience. That's what their organization she runs, Activate to Captivate. The next part, important foundational training element for our program is Science Communication Skills course. So this is run by um, Sandra Singh Lo from um, Lowdown on Science. She runs a, she has a podcast uh, on NPR called Lowdown on Science. And she comes, she's been coming for past five, six years on UCI campus to give this 10 week training in science communication skills to our, our students and postdocs. At the end of this 10 week long course, they end up recording their mini TED style talks, which are on our YouTube channel. If, you know, based on your consent, we'll post them on YouTube. Otherwise, a lot of people actually use those talks to actually communicate with their family members, tell them you know, how awesome research they're doing. Some people end up putting that on your LinkedIn profile or resume so that you can, other people can see how great you are at communicating your science. And then um, uh, maybe Dr. Fruman will agree with me that you know we've gone and sat through a lot of graduate day research talks, and you can really clearly see that you know some of the students and postdocs who've gone through this you know uh, Sandra Singh Lowe's courses, and they are like such an amazing orators. You know they are able to effectively communicate the, your, their science, and you know really identify which audience they are talking to. If you want to learn more about like, you know, these talks, some of the people who provided consent, their um, videos are on our YouTube channel, GPS 10 UC Irvine YouTube channel. Now, I would like to give this to Dr. Fruman because uh, once I, um, when we transitioned to GPS 10 program, we wanted to ensure that we also provide academic advancement activities which there is a lot of overlap in professional development, uh, non-academic careers and academic. So we tried to provide that here. I'll give it to Dr. Fruman. Do you want to talk about the academic activities, David? Sure, thanks, Render. Yeah, so the NIH funding was designed to help prepare students and postdocs for non-academic careers. And, and while some of the activities could also be, as, as Render said, you know, the byproduct could help you in an academic career, we, we wanted to, to to refocus a little bit or rebalance since we had campus funding now and had more freedom to do other things. We wanted to really help prepare and encourage those who would like to pursue an academic career. And one way to do that is to, to provide training in how to write NIH fellowships. And th these are really biomedical trainees who, who apply for NIH. Uh, and we hope to develop similar workshops for those who apply for NSF or Department of Energy down the road. Uh, but, but the goal is to, to uh, we started this workshop in the spring. It's a nine week workshop with some lectures and some peer, re uh, peer review of writing assignments for elements of the fellowship. And it was very well received and we're gonna turn it into an annual course that's offered uh, with the co uh, collaboration of graduate division as a university studies course. So that was the first academic enhancement activity uh, we've also been partnering with, uh, with associate deans to, to present the Nature Master Classes, which is a, where we've licensed this um, really helpful suite of webinars that Nature provides about how to write and publish. Uh, and so you have access to those. And then we sprinkle in other activities like this visualizing science act, uh, activity coming up about you know, how to make great figures, how to talk about your data or your models, and then uh, visits from uh, from people, from uh, editors of journals, like we had last week from Cell Reports, you know, how, how do you navigate the publication world? Uh, now, obviously, these will, these are useful activities, whether or not you stay in academia, getting fellowships and learning how to publish papers will serve you well in, in any career. Uh, but, the, but we've really started to expand and will continue to expand these sorts of activities to try to give the holistic training that I talked about to help you prepare for whatever you would like to do. And, you know, I've, I've always tried to, to walk the fine line here as, as a director of a program and now academic director of a program that's sending a lot of people off the academic track where, which isn't really my primary goal. My goal is to help people find the career that they are best suited for and find fulfilling. And for many people that is academia. I've been a professor here for 20 years 
I've had opportunities to move to industry, but I've always stayed because I love the academic environment. I love working with students and postdocs. I love uh, teaching and uh, academic freedom. Uh, and you know, it's not easy writing grants, but it can be actually interesting and fun. So there's a lot of advantages to pursuing an academic career. And I think a lot of students get discouraged somehow and decide to leave because they feel like they, they're, it's not articulated to them what the advantages are. So I want everybody to, to know that uh, we're not trying to dis, dis, uh, disincentivize academic careers or discourage you from pursuing them. And that if that's a possibility for you and something you consider that we'd like to help you get there. So that's the goal of the academic enhancement activities. Uh, it's rebalancing a bit uh, to, to give you the holistic preparation you need. And with that, um, before I turn it back to Harinder, I'll just say that speaking of teaching, I actually have to teach at five o'clock, little snafu in my schedule. So I can't uh, stay till 5.30 to answer questions, but I'm sure you can get your questions answered from Harinder. I wanna thank the guest speaker at the end. And I look forward to seeing many of you at future activities. Good luck, stay safe and hang in there. Thank you, David. Uh, so as David was saying, you know, these are the academic um, academic activities we perform. And, you know, again, these are also very unique ones, which, of course, when David and I uh, start to plan and uh, prepare the curriculum for different programs, we always go online and look at what's been published and what works and you know, what challenges people face in building these activities and, you know, how successful those programs have been. So pretty much um, a lot of the academic adv uh, activities, advancement activities have come out of culmination of like really distilled down the best practices from those academic activities. And we built that into our, our programming here. So with that, the next part of the train, you know, once you understand, you know, you've gone through this training in communication skills we talked about, you know, which can be applied to academic uh, presentations and research and, you know, making your best diagrams. We try to give you these mini courses and certificate programs, which are focused on those that specific career, which you might you might want to get into in future. One of the examples is the business concept for STEM scientists course. Um, this is a course uh, which is in uh, collaboration with UCI Beal Applied Innovation. It's been one of the most popular courses amongst the STEM trainees, where they learn about business model canvas, you know, how to fund, how, how does the business enterprise works and if they're planning to patent their technology and maybe move into, uh, you know, starting their own um, startup company or something, work in a larger company, this gives you training on that. And at the end of this course, we always incentivize by, you know, this is a certificate program and then you, there are some prizes because you almost do Shark Tank like business pitch and there's a business pitch competition where we bring in hypothetical venture capitalists who will gauge, uh, you know, based on your pitch, they'll, you know, we pick the best um, um, ideas. The other course we've uh, recently launched was in uh, science and medical writing. And this has been, this was a very successful course because large majority of our trainees from biomedical PhDs, postdocs get into medical writing careers. So this was most apt to do that because um, we wanted to give that training right now so that they're successful and they know what to expect, expect as they're getting into those careers. And also these, a lot of careers have these writing exams, which you need to do. So during this certificate course, mini course, we provide that writing assignment and prepare you so that you don't, you're not taken by surprise when you get into those things. Now, um, David mentioned about the visualizing science. This is a mini boot camp you're doing again, you know, the idea why we are trying to do these mini courses and certificates is, you know, if we were to do like an event, which is five modules and there is no relation with, you know, they're not related and then you're not enrolled into that thing, then, I mean, be very honest, you know, after a point, like, you know, the attendance drops because you don't really see the bigger picture and you don't appreciate the bigger, you know, interconnected elements. So this has become a very popular, like, you know, the, the initiative in the train element to give those transferable skills, which you will use in future. Next, I want to talk about our collaboration with uh, university extension courses, the Division of Continuing Education. So all of you registered for the program and I got your information. Some of you did IDP and then you had to go on LinkedIn and become members and you had to sign up for the newsletter and all that. So, and then today you're attending this in-person or virtual <laughs> um, uh, orientation. Some of you may have just 
watch the videos which we had posted on YouTube. And that's fine you know, as long as you did that to understand the program, how it works. And, and you know, after this, you're gonna start attending some of the events. So I keep, our program keep tracks of your data, the number of events you're attending. We used to have a model of, you know, professional development credits, which we will see that how many events you attended, number of hours you have participated in the program. And then based on that, we'll give you uh, certain credits and those credits accrue over time as you're attending the events. Now, once you have attended certain critical mass number of events, which is like five to six, you have the opportunity to enroll into Division of Continuing Education courses, which are $700 worth of courses on many different topics, ranging from data science, business management, leadership, and drug device, drug discovery stuff. And a lot of our trainees have taken those courses and found it very useful. So this is an excellent opportunity, which I would highly encourage for you to uh, take these courses, but for you to take those courses, you have to go through the whole training process and you know attend some of the events. Okay. Just want to make sure. Okay. Perfect. So next let's get into the experience part. As I was saying, once you've gone through exploring the careers, you know, four or five careers you're interested to getting to get into, and we give you that specific training. The first foundation communication skills can be applied to everything. Then we get into the experience that, okay, Harinder, now tell me how do I, you know, what is it, how does it look like to be working in that job sector? Can you give me that hands-on experience or shadowing someone internship? So this is the, uh, the, the pillar where we give you that training. We take you, uh, takes rooms and postdocs on industry site visits. These are some of the pictures on, you know, the, the site visits we've done in the past. And you go and visit, usually these are half day events. You go visit them, they walk you through the whole facility and how many different, how different units are there, how they function and where do PhDs, postdocs are working in that, that sector. And then at the end of it, there is a networking event. You get to ask your specific questions from these industry leaders who are working in that, that industry. So that has been another very useful um, element of our program where no other place gives you that hands-on experience. So this has led to automatically to internship opportunities. Once you are, if you're one of those people who've gone to industry site visit, now you know the people who are working in that, uh, that company, you connect with them on LinkedIn and you write them an email and they'll say, okay, you know what? We have an internship opportunity coming up. I know that you were there at the event, at the, at the site visit, you should come and work with us. And that's your way, that's your foot into the door of you know, getting into this you know, um, industry. And other than outside campus units, you know, we work with all these different examples I've put here, but within UCI also, UCI Applied Innovation uh, and Office of Research, they do have internship sort of opportunities which you can participate in. A lot of times these are very formal uh, internships where you get paid. Of course, you have to take permission from your PI if that, you know, that they are okay to be for you to leave the lab and participate in this internship. But a lot of times these are very soft and, you know, internship, as I call them, like shadowing opportunities. You just go and spend like maybe one hour, two hours a week, and then do it for a couple of weeks. And this still gives you the taste of that, you know, how that industry functions, then you build the connections right there. And then it helps you to transition into those, uh, those roles. So it's almost like a talent building pipeline sort of a model we are using here. And it's been very successful. Large number of uh, our alumni who went through our program, they said that the experience part, industry site was this internships, you know, that was the most impactful element. So the, now let's come to the last part. Once you've gone through all this, now you're like, okay, Herinder, I've gone through all this thing. Now I need your help to transition into. I mean, you might think that, okay, I've learned everything. I'm good at it. I'm going to apply and I'm going to get the job. Uh, not quite the case. It's a totally different ball game. You got to uh, build your resume based on the job you're applying. You need to have a very special, like, you know, polished cover letter. You need to have a very professional LinkedIn profile. So we provide those opportunities. We partner with Division of Career Pathways to give you resume writing, cover letter writing workshops. Uh, there are LinkedIn workshop series. We run LinkedIn basic, intermediate, and advanced. Uh, given this is pandemic and we've done a lot of events online and then the, all the recordings of these events on the three LinkedIn workshops are posted on our uh, GPS 10 YouTube channel. You can tap into that and watch it at your own pace. But we'll try to do it again so that you're able to ask specific questions from these people. We also do things where we bring in uh, recruiters. 
we get their uh, sense of like, you know, what do they really look for in candidates when they are hiring them, you know? Is it that their publication, you know, how many uh, awards they've gotten or what should they be, what, what, what do they look in the resume or cover letter of a person when they're hiring them? These events have been very successful. And another way to actually really connect and, you know, easily transition is doing networking events. So we partner with a lot of Orange County's uh, networking organizations, one of them being uh, Device Alliance, Orange County. For those of you who are not aware, Orange County is the biggest hub in the United States, I think after San Antonio, maybe before San Antonio in medical devices. So it's a huge medical device industry here and Device Alliance is one of those uh, networking organizations. Then you have MedTech Innovation Exchange and Biotech Network. So you, we partner with them to offer this MedTech Mega Mixers where you, we have around five, five, 400 to 500 people, industry professionals and students, postdocs come and network with them. So that's your excellent way to actually talk to people, exchange business cards, which is not happening in person now, but then you know there's still networking opportunities being offered by these organizations. And so once you've gone through that, another thing is now, um, well, I need to talk to someone who can help me, you know, really give me a taste of how things work there, you know, maybe an informational interview to learn more about what the job is about. So we run something called this alumni networking, alumni mentoring program. So this is a program where we connect you with alumni and then there's a mentor mentee dyad is built and then you work with your mentors and learn about jobs and how to transition. What should you put in your resume? How is it to be you know, working in that job? Maybe there'll be some internship opportunities come out of that. So these are some of the, uh, the profiles of the mentors who were there for 20, um, 19 mentoring program and this year 2020 mentoring program is still ongoing and one of our mentor from 2020 program is here today she's going to be talking to you for a few minutes and explaining what the successful parts what she loved about the program and she in fact lauren served as men she served as mentee in 2019 program so that's a really real practical example that you know she was a mentee she learned those things and now she's serving coming back and serving as a mentor so i would highly encourage you um, all of you to participate in this thing usually these are helpful when you are your in, in your post candidacy phase or if you're a postdoc take like six months to sort of like adapt into your new lab so that uh, pi doesn't go looking for you where's my postdoc so after six months i would say you know once you have a better idea about what you want to do you know where you want to transition into then participate in this mentoring programs so um you cannot talk about um policy without or you cannot <laughs> what is that so you cannot talk about career professional development training and applying your scientific skills into society without talking about policy right and we are in the middle of pandemic, we have this election season coming up, without getting to too much political details and all that, you really need to be aware how to engage uh, the audience, engage the community members and making them realize the importance of science you're doing. And additionally, a lot of you might be getting frustrated with the fact that we are not getting enough grants and the fun scientific funding is going down. And so we have this program called Public Policy Prep, which gives uh, science policy and advocacy training for STEM scientists, which is PhD students and postdocs. This program was funded by Burroughs Welcome Fund for first three years. And after that, we have been partnering with Journal of Science Policy Governance, Union of Concerned Scientists, Rich Dury Program at UCI to offer the certificate program in science policy for STEM scientists. These are some of our students who went to Capitol Hill uh, who were trained by this policy program and then they campaigned for some of the issues which matter to them and you know whether it's the research funding or scientific um, uh, you know specific topics of on based on the research they are doing so again this is another program which is a long certificate program we are almost coming to an end of it we had like 12 different sessions there'll be a policy pitch competition on november 9 i'll be sending advertisements out and you can attend that pitch competition see how they were trained all throughout the process of certificate program and see how they are campaigning and talking to their senators lawmakers and staffers and asking for that systemic change in policy surrounding that let's see so bringing you back to where we started from the 
the skills in high demand, which academia or industry looks for. So these are some of the, you know, I tried to connect it all together for communication skills, Breeze elevated to elevator pitch workshop and effective communication skills and Sandra's SciComm skills will help you to prepare for the communication and public speaking skills. When you take the business concepts uh, course, this will help you to prepare you prepare you for business, learning the business entrepreneurship, leadership, and all those aspects. When you take the extension courses, you're going to get like this firsthand information and, you know, more curriculum uh, based uh, training in these uh, skill sets, which are important. Policy I talked about, you have to understand the whole like academic enterprise to campaign for your research topic or increase funding. The networking opportunities, which really go in to be able to tie it all together. Let's see. Okay. So this is another thing. Again, um, this is something we started like even before um, pandemic. We started a GPS Tem Radio, which is a nice way to connect you all to um, science policy folks, professionals who are alumni. They come back and they're on this interview for 20 minutes. They'll talk about their career journey and what they do, how you can get involved. We have another podcast on health and wellness. During this time, we're all struggling. I think you know, there are many different ways we are trying to cope with it, but then um, sometimes it's difficult to ask for help. So we bring in mental health professionals who will help you to how to really keep maintain your calm in this difficult environment. And also as you're going through your academic training, I, as I always say, like by third year is when you're gonna to start to hit rock bottom and you're gonna need some support and therefore, with these podcasts, we try to make you aware that you're not alone. And these are common issues which every trainee face faces when they are in training. And these are some of the ways you can cope with that. We recently launched the Career and Professional Development Podcast. If you do not have time to come sit through events or it's too long, I'll watch through YouTube. Horrendo, it was too long. Just tune into this podcast, which is going to be very short, 15 to 20 minutes. Listen to it as you're doing your regular everyday activities. And we're going to try to ramp up now, you know, bring in a lot more speakers. So if you have, again, you know, we are open to you giving us suggestions on who you would like to interview, like us to interview. We can either interview that person for you because that's the kind of career or the person's professional uh, job you're interested in. Or you say, okay, Harinder, I would like to interview this person. So we are open to that also. Just shoot me an email and I'll take care of things. And we'll do a little bit of training also for you. If you need some training on how to communicate and interview people for podcasts, happy to do that for you. Uh, Science Cafe, again, this is an innovative approach because you'll be doing a lot of technical writing. You'll be writing grants and papers and but then wish there was some avenue where you could really like, you know, pour your heart out, you know, your whole thing about how the grad school is going. Or like, you know, we have some people who want to talk about their transition on how they went from grad school to postdoc and then, you know, faculty. So they write their thoughts and feel free to like write anything, pick any topic. It could also be about your size and just say that you would like to write something, send us your first draft and we have a whole uh, board of editorial board, which will help you polish and, you know, walk you, you know, really train you through the whole writing process. And then it gets published on Science Cafe, which is a blog, GPS 10 blog, and we'll showcase on that. This is a great, excellent option to put something on your resume, even after, you know, whatever kind of career you want to get into, because most of the careers look for good, excellent writing skills. Um, this is the last one, uh, you know, I'm sure you're like, okay, Harinder, you're doing great, but I would like to work with my peers also. Some opportunity to sit with my peers and talk to them that let's see how they are working on the career we're interested in. So we started this career cohorts. These are peer-to-peer -peer cohorts where people who are interested in a you know, certain career, like uh, they come together and then discuss, okay, I think we need to have an event focus on this and we need to bring in this speaker and we need to create maybe a sense of community amongst our uh, trainees so that we can all work together on this, this particular job or that particular career. So we have uh, four or five of those career cohorts active right now. The others are still in making and it's a slow process to build that and gain that momentum. The active cohorts are business and consulting for STEM scientists. Consulting is one career a lot of our scientists get into. So you can go on our website and 
you know, look on the toolbar, create cohorts, get into business consult, BCSS, and connect with the people who run this cohort, tell them that you would like to meet with them, and they can start attending the meetings which they have monthly. We just started with the data science club. Uh, a majority of our um, non-biomedical, sometimes biomedical folks also get into data science as a career. So this is a, again, a cohort built by PhD students and postdocs who are interested in data science. We, I meet with them once a month and they tell me what they want from me. And if you wanna bring in a speaker, if there's an honorarium involved, I help you with that. And you just have to come up with an idea, an event, a training, and then you basically take the lead, gain that experience, to you know, easily transition to that career. So the science policy I just talked about, the art in science is another interesting one. So I really like, this is really close to my heart because I remember doing experiments in lab for five years and then four years in postdoc. I, I don't know if some of you are aware about immunohistochemistry and site, you know, immunofluorescent staining. There's so many hundreds and thousands of images I have, but I use only five of those images for my grant or publications. There's like, 5,900 images sit, just sitting there and of no use. But you still, when I look at it, I'm like, but this looks so pretty. So this is one avenue where we will give you an opportunity to express your science and then talk about that science. And you can also use, you know, express your like artistic talent to express your scientific ideas. This also helps with what we were talking earlier with visualizing science. You know, when you're submitting a paper, it's, it's mandatory almost, you know, for you to have a schematic or scientific diagram so that you can convince the reviewer that, okay, well, this is what I'm talking about, visualize. Same thing with the grants also. So this is one you know, uh, cohort you can work with. Joanne Lee, who actually does a lot of our, the, the logo designing, she's amazing. She's a PhD student in biomedical engineering and I would connect with her and she can connect you to many different avenues, how you can actually start honing the skills right now. So science communication is one, you know, which becomes part of Sandra's and, and Bree's elevator pitch stuff. Um, but then we're trying to um, launch a GPSM science SciCom podcast. So that would be one place if you would like to talk about your research for like, we'll give you maximum five minutes. And within five minutes, you'll have to build the science pitch and we'll pod broadcast it via podcast. And you can connect, you know, and tell people about excellent science you do, right? So that's the whole about the career cohorts. Let me see if I'm missing anything. Newsletter, stay tuned for now. I have your data. I will put you into the newsletter if you have not subscribed yet. This is the one where we put all the events which our GPS 10 is doing or all the events which are happening on campus or now things are happening like you can really attend any event, whatever is happening nationally. You can either go on LinkedIn, Twitter and look for these events or we'll try to put all the events in this newsletter so you can just, you know, you don't have to go and search every day for events. You can really pick and choose from these things. Let's see, so you met David. David is part of <laughs> Institute of Immunology and he's also a faculty in molecular biology. And I always try to put this slide because some of you might be wondering like, Harender, why are you doing this? What is your background? So I got my PhD in cardiovascular biology from Temple School of Medicine. I became a postdoc um, in uh, neuroscience at U of Illinois, Chicago. And I was very active in postdoc association during that time, I volunteered for a lot of different organizations. One of them was Chicago-based scientists. We started this nonprofit called Scientists. And then um, I would, you know, maybe you guys should look at future research. This is a, a nonprofit working on scientists changing science. You want to bring about that change, you know, take all your frustrations out when you're PhD students and postdocs and just translate that into a piece policy piece and submit that and ask for that change, whether it's funding on academic enterprise, the training, the way it is done, the mentoring or benefits or postdoc salaries and many different topics you can pick from there. So I was part of that. That's how I decided to do something on these lines as a full-fledged career. So that's about me. And what I'll do is uh, we'll go for the questions in the end and but I want to bring our alumni, Lauren Sheehan. She was part of our program for past three years. She recently transitioned into field application scientist position, I think in February or January. Um, Lauren can correct me on that, when exactly that was. And she was a very active member. I've seen her attend many events and go for industry site visits, participate in mentoring program. Now she's coming back and serving as mentor for 2020 mentoring program. 
and I would like to invite Lauren to come and share her experiences. Anything specific you would like to share with our attendees and members today? Lauren? Thank you, Harinder, and hello, everyone. So as Harinder said, I'm Lauren. I was involved with GPS STEM from around 2018 to uh, earlier this year, February 2020. And like Harinder said, I'm still involved. Um, I'm now a mentor in GPS STEM. Um, so that's been a great experience. But just a little background on me and how um, I came about to becoming um, active in GPS STEM. So I got my PhD at Virginia Tech in 2018. And while I was there, I was really on the path to becoming a PI. That's really all I knew. And Virginia Tech had nothing like GPS STEM there for me to learn about different careers or even careers that are just um, different from becoming a PI. So when I joined UCI as a postdoc in May of 2018, that's where I was exposed to GPS STEM and I started going to different workshops and seminar series and things like that. And I became too exposed to all these careers both inside and outside of academia and became enlightened to what I can do with my PhD and postdoc background. So like I said, I became involved in networking events and seminar series and different workshops. Um, and for basically all of 2019, I was applying for careers in industry. Um, and GPS STEM was instrumental in this because I, I learned how to write a resume. Um, I learned how to make my LinkedIn profile um, professional, and I also gained a lot of connections through networking at these different events. Um, and ultimately, so I, I did um, participate as a mentee in GPS STEM mentoring program, and that's ultimately where I got the position that I'm at now um, with a biotech company uh, that's headquartered out in Austria called Lexigen. So I now work as a field application scientist there as of February 2020. Um, but ultimately, GPS STEM got me this job um, and it prepared me for a life in industry. So that's a little background um, for me. And as far as maybe some advice I could give you um, for participating in this program, what I would say is just go to try to go to almost every seminar. I would say if you have some free time, try to attend, even if you can't attend the full thing, just go. And even if you're not necessarily interested, um, like I wasn't necessarily, when I first joined, interested in a field application scientist position. And it was more because I didn't know anything about it. But as I started attending these workshops and different events where there was field application scientists, I started saying, wow, this is a really cool career. Um, I would also suggest taking my IDP very seriously. Uh, when I first did it, I actually matched with an FAS or MSL career, and I didn't pay too much mind to it because I, I didn't think that it was true. And here I am now, and I'm completely happy with where, where I'm at um, as an FAS. So I would definitely say, take my IDP seriously when you do um, fill it out. And as far as like with GPSM, don't only take this as an opportunity to learn, but also to network. Um, my, my network grew substantially. Um, thank you, Harinder. And also just due to the GPS STEM mentoring program. Um, I was connected with three mentors and then from there they connected me to a number of people. So my network has grown substantially um, after participating in this mentoring program. So um, I would just suggest again, get involved with any and all events that you can um, through GPS STEM and yeah, take my IDP seriously and see what it tells you. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn or um, by email, whichever I'm happy to talk to.